This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. My name is Philip Winston, and my guest today is Philip Mayhew. Phil is a co-founder and the CTO at GameDriver, a company that brings test automation to the video game industry. Before GameDriver, he ran his own consultancy for over a decade, which specialized in performance and functional test automation for Fortune 500 companies. Phil, did I leave anything out of your bio that you wanted to add? Phil, that pretty much covers everything. I have a, you know, just the early background. I have a degree in computer science from North Carolina State University. Great. We're going to use the term game throughout this episode, but I'd like to frame this in the beginning and understand that we might be talking about applications that are wider than just games. I've seen your company use the term immersive experience. How would you describe the set of applications we're going to be talking about today? What characteristics do they have? So, you know, of course, our name is derived off of, you know, gaming automation, game driver. But, you know, that was, we came up with that name, you know, four years ago. And and now as the landscape has started to change with augmented reality, virtual reality, where you've got people learning how to, you know, change a tire from an immersive experience. So we now have this broader application landscape of, that needs automated testing. So it's not your classic, we're just testing games anymore. We're, we're testing all kinds of industrial usages of the applications that are being put out these days. So there are challenges to write automated tests for any application. Maybe we can talk a little bit about those since your background prior to GameDriver was in a wider field of applications. And then we can zoom into talking about the specific challenges for games. But to start, why is test automation hard? Sure. So we can break this into two separate categories. We have sort of an, an educational dilemma, and then we have you know technological problems that have to be solved as well. So I like to compare where game testing automation is today is very similar to where enterprise application testing was, automated testing was 12, 15 years ago. You have a lot of people who have been doing manual testing who are not familiar with how to do automated testing. So we need to be able to empower those people to you know, write automated test cases and implement those test cases. So what are some of the ways we can do that? We can do that through training. And from a technological standpoint, we can empower them with tools. In this case, we're using GameDriver to empower our game testers to write automated test cases. That covers the, you know, the, the educational side of things. From a technological standpoint, when you're testing an enterprise application for you know, functional automation, the buttons are generally in the same location. Text is, you know, very static. We're looking at a, a static 2D environment where feedback is very specific on what a user does. When you look at a 3D game, I mean, that's a it's a completely different landscape, and precision of points becomes an issue. You know, if you move a control pad, you know, a D pad a little bit, you know, all right, so we're, we're talking floating point values now. We're no longer talking pixel exactness. So now we're having to deal with, with those kinds of issues. And while it seems complex, you know, to write an automated test case for a game, we're not trying to be able to walk a character from start to finish through a game how do we defeat the the dragon to to get the key to save the princess we don't have to have a complex scenario to be successful there's an old enterprise application you know automation thing you know it's something like with 20 percent of automation you can complete 80 percent of your testing so the you know the old 2080 and I don't know that we can successfully draw that kind of comparison in game testing now, but you've got to look at defects that are raised, you know, by testers or developers and say, hey, you know, this is a reoccurring issue or this is something we could automate easily and cut down some of our manual testing time. You know, we're not trying to wipe out manual testing. 
that's not the goal. The goal is to save time, which saves money. And we can do that through using tools, and in this instance, Game Driver, to simplify the process of being able to create repeatable test cases that generate repeatable results. And with that, we can add confidence into the, you know, regression testing or, you know, a minimal acceptance test suite that allows us to have confidence so that we're moving forward in our in our development life cycle. And we're not introducing a lot of issues or, you know, finding finding issues that we didn't know existed. So sure, there's going to be plenty of edge cases that are, are difficult to automate out, but there is a, still a large portion of testing that can be automated and it can be done very simply. So one of the things you mentioned was maybe to contrast enterprise software and games. And one aspect of that that I was reading about is games used to be sort of one and done, that you'd ship the game way back when on a cartridge or a DVD, and there weren't any updates after that point. And then we get through a period where the games are still on standard media, but maybe they're updated, bugs are fixed. But I think now we're reaching a point where many games are sort of developed and maintained indefinitely. Have you seen that trend and how does that correlate or impact automated testing? I think that's a, that's a bit of an ideological question or dilemma that we have here because if you look back and you know I'm 40 years old now, I remember having Windows 3.1, Windows 95. I mean, once you installed that, that was it. But with the the mainstream introduction of always on internet, you know, you're constantly getting Windows updates. And it's not just games that are doing this. It's software across the board with your uh, mobile devices. It's so easy for developers to just push updates. So I think that it's a plus side is that, you know, if we have an issue, sure, we can easily fix it. But I wonder that it also is limiting the testing that happens because now that you know, we, we can say, oh, we can push an update at any point. There's no need to necessarily spend as much time testing a product. And so, you know, it's just getting pushed out the door a lot sooner with hopes that, you know, patches can can be pushed downstream at a later point. You know, we've recently seen in the news that where that that has had repercussions of, you know, detrimental business results where people have said, you know, we'll just push it out the door and, you know, do updates later. Let me mention a previous episode here. It was episode 339 with Jafar Sultani on continuous delivery for multiplayer games. And one of the comments he had was, we are heavily relying on an army of manual testers to test the game. But relative to this idea of sort of a long-lived application, he mentioned that once you sort of got rid of those manual testers after the initial release, or they you know, drifted off to other projects, you lost the confidence in being able to even make small changes. So I imagine with automated testing, one of the goals is to give developers the confidence. Is that an objective that you see with your work? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's you can substitute manual testers here with developers, you know, a developer moves off a project and what's gone? Well, you know, across any, you know, the development history of, of software applications, retaining constantly updated and up-to-date documentation has always been a problem. And so when you remove an individual who has what seems like an infinite space of knowledge in his head to another project, that information just is, is gone having automated test cases as a way to re retain information and documentation as a result of doing automated testing. So, you know, when a, when a manual tester moves on, a lot of knowledge is gone with him. And so if we're taking some of that knowledge and we're investing in building automated test cases with it, when they go, the developers can know, all right, we still have this huge suite of testing that's been done that we can, again, execute without having that guy's or that person's knowledge that was specifically doing the testing. So I think that it's a way of building documentation without saying, sit down here and write out a bunch of documents about what was tested and how it's tested. And the developer can sit there and it's not just going back through emails. He can specifically look at the test cases that were written, that were executed, 
and have some sense of confidence that we are we have code coverage on this. And if we execute these tests and I make a change here, then we can sort of have a feedback loop to know and have confidence that we're not introducing new breaking changes. And I mean, this is, we're talking about games here, but that's no different than, than any other application that's being developed. And, you know, when, when people leave off a project, how do we retain confidence in what we're still pushing out? So in that previous episode, there was a lot of talk about unit testing and they did have a lot of unit tests, even though they were still doing manual testing. So what is the difference? What is the line between unit testing and the type of test automation you normally deal with? And does it have to do with whether the entire application is running or are there other factors? Yeah, so I think the difference there is we also need to focus on user input. So that is a, when, when it comes to game testing, that is a key component. What is the user doing on the game pad and how is that impacting what's happening in the environment? So what I've deemed are the two most important parts of automated testing is one, doing accurate inputs that would simulate what a user is doing. And two, how do we validate that? So we've got a, a input and then a, a validation feedback loop to continue to test what we're trying to test and understand the results of that test. So while a, a developer has been very focused on you know unit tests, uh, what specifically is happening on this method execution or in this class instantiation or, or whatever it is, and on the, on the flip side of that, we've got manual testers who are testing as this is a black box. They have no insight into you know, what objects are doing what, and they're only doing validation based on visual cues. With the automated testing now, we're empowering them to be able to enhance what they're validating. All right, so we push a button, this block turns red. All right, we see it's red but let's validate that it is the correct hue of red. You know, maybe you're working on a, a game that is for people who are colorblind. So we there's specific things that need to be validated that aren't necessarily easy for a manual tester to do, but it's very simple to do in an automated fashion. So to separate that line, I, I think that we have to think more about user input, what it's driving, and focus less on the specifics on again, on unit testing, all right, that's that's handled by the developer, but now we're, we're an automated tester. What can we do to add value to our, our testing life cycle here? Okay, one more question that's kind of defining our terms, and then we're going to jump into sort of the process of adding automated testing to a project. And then we're going to talk about game driver, and we'll try to cover everything. So this last defining our terms question was, I saw the term collision testing, and that's not a term that is normally used with regular applications. What is collision testing and what difficulties does it present in automation? So when games, you know, when you have objects and games interacting, collisions happen. Sometimes they're important and sometimes they're not important. And as a manual tester, it might be easy to see a collision happen, you know, you bump into a wall. Can you actually move through the wall or you know, physics enable and you bounce off the wall, whatever, whatever the game structure is for that. We do have the ability to sort of supplement from a testing perspective, you know, how do we register a collision is happening? And can we register collisions are happening on specific objects when certain events happen, when the user bumps into a wall. All right, let's make sure that the collision code is actually kicking off and that something is happening. Again, those are those are very very easy to do visually most of the time or, you know, if you have very tiny objects that are colliding, maybe from a visual perspective they're not easy to do, but what if from an automated perspective we can have some sort of helpers that are available to signify that yes, the collision happened. And now we can, you know, build more testing that's covering a huge sweep of objects in different scenarios that are that is, where collision is very important that we understand what's happening. So it, we can build a huge data set of, you know, of collision interactions and, and test all those in a massive sweep of automated testing without, you know, having to sit there and look at an Excel sheet of, you know, a hundred different things of the collisions we got to test and validate. 
Yeah, so that does sound pretty specific to games or simulations or, I guess, VR environments, stuff like that. So now let's talk about automated testing in terms of like we're adding it to our project. Maybe what are some of the steps we do? What are some of the things to watch out for? So what is the desired impact of automated testing on a project? Suppose the software game project has minimal automated testing and you're, you're going to help them ramp that up. And after a year or something, they have a lot of automated testing. What differences are you trying to drive there? So from the beginning, I guess sort of a personal goal of mine has been to limit the impact that implementing our product has on being able to add automated testing. Like, you know, we don't want you to change your architecture of your game. We don't want to complicate builds. We want to try to be as lightweight and as simple as possible so that, you know, it's less things that developers have to figure out to make this work. We want it to be very seamless. So in the beginning, people are like, I think they get overwhelmed by like, you know, what do we do? You have too many moving parts. So I think one of the easiest ways to get started is, all right, let's do something very simple. Usually when a game starts, you know, your intro screen comes up and hit the start button. So let's let's write a simple test case that, you know, we, it starts your game. It waits for the object to appear that says, you know, press start button. And then we press start. And then let's validate the correct scene loads and the game is ready to go. And, and whatever you know, state capacity is required to identify that the game is ready. And once you get, once you get people to write a, just a simple test case, it's like the wheels start turning and they just, you know, it's just coming to them because they've been in their project. They know more about the game than we would. And as the wheels are turning, they're like, oh, wow, we can do we can do this. We can do that. Suddenly, all the defects that they've opened previously are just flashing up in their in their mind. And they're thinking, oh, yeah, now we could we could automate that pretty easily. We can test that every time. And, you know, one of our first customers, I can't remember the running total, but, you know, it was uh, Last I heard, I was kind of blown away at how many test cases that that they had written. So it's, and you know, it's it's like anything else. You know, you you do a lot of hard work maybe on a test case, like how do we do this? But now we can copy, you know, some of that test case and we can reuse it over here for doing something very similar. It's like, you know, it's like developing a hard product. You develop a piece of it. Oh yeah, now we can reuse that. And you know, before you know it, you're just turning out test cases and. And I think there's probably at some point you leave a proportional limit where you're you're creating more test cases than might be adding value in some respect. But it really opens the door once you get past that initial hurdle of, all right, let's get it installed. Let's add it to the game. All right, how do we connect everything together? And once you get past that, it's, you know, the wheels are turning. Developers are very excited because now it's taking a little bit of burden off their shoulders and they're going to be able to shift that back to, you know, an automated test engineer who's going to help them figure this stuff out and make it work. Yeah. I've seen the same thing with regular applications. Once the framework is in place and once everyone sees the, whether it's hooked up to CI or whatever's reporting the test results, once you sort of see that process, it can grow from there. So how about the trade-offs of when to write tests in the development process? I can imagine saying, hey, write them as early as possible, but especially with a game, you might be iterating and changing the game a lot. Could you end up writing tests prematurely? What have you recommended or what do you see people doing? Yeah, and I think this, you know, very closely relates with an with application. I mean, you've got if you get testers in too early. They're, you know, they're writing test cases and then, you know, maybe some development happens on the back end and suddenly those test cases are invalidated. It can become a very complex loop where you've got, you know, people writing requirements and, you know, maybe the testers aren't reviewing those requirements or unaware of those requirements. Again, you know, we're in, we're manual testing right now and those testers are probably not even aware of requirements documents that are being written to determine how development's going to be done. So there is going to be some delay there. You're not going to be able to throw testers in immediately. But I think as you know, games are being developed, 
we need to be cognizant of, all right, now we can do some automated testing. So, you know, should we shift how we're developing games a little bit so that we're opening up the opportunity to start doing automated testing earlier than we would normally throw a manual tester in? Because we don't want to throw a manual tester in or throw automated testing in and raising a bunch of defects, which, well, yeah, of course, we know that doesn't work and it's not supposed to work. And yeah, we kind of, you know, sort of fudge that right now and it's going to change anyway. So don't open defects on this stuff. So I think there's, you know, there's going to have to be a little bit of thought process into, all right, are we developing games in such a sense that also makes sense to take advantage of automated testing or any kind of testing at an earlier stage? And, you know, maybe maybe big studios are already doing that to bring manual testers in sooner to help validate things. I, I can't really uh, comment to that, but, you know, I think there is there is the opportunity to test early. You know, people like to say, you know, let's fail fast. That's, uh, you know, that's one of the going logics around there today. So uh, yes and no, it's, uh, you know, some some opportunity may, may exist to test early and some opportunity may not exist to test early, but testing early can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. So <laughs> I think there, there's an argument for both sides and I think there's ways to make it work, but, you know, whether that's always an opportunity, you know, maybe, maybe not. So we've talked about this a little bit, but who is actually writing these automated tests? Is there an opportunity for manual testers to learn just enough programming if they don't know it already? Or does it require a software engineer who's who's very experienced? What range of abilities or backgrounds can people have to write successful automated tests? You know, personally, I think that's a very interesting question because in my opinion, you know, if you look in the landscape and you, you know, you, when you're in college and you've got all these, this younger generation who are huge gamers and, you know, the, the one thing they want, oh, what do you want to do? Oh man, I'd love to get into, you know, working at a game studio. All right. How do you do that? Well, I don't know. You know, I'll, I've created some of my own games and I'm just, you know, I'll just keep interviewing and hoping I, I break into the industry. I think a lot of people know that that's a, that's a very tough thing to do. And what this actually does creates an opportunity where people with, you know, some development experience, you know, fresh out of school, they learn testing and they can implement these automated tests pretty easily because they, they've, you know, taken their own initiative to learn how to use engines like Unreal and Unity and, they understand the basics of game design. They're, they're taking game design classes in college. They, they may have taken some testing classes as well. But we have this, you know, huge population. And I say younger, but, you know, there's also older people who have just been doing development, who have always wanted to do game development. But, you know, it's hard to break into the game development scene on a larger scale. And... This opens up an opportunity for them to learn a lot how the underlying games are being developed. They're able to understand that. They're able to write test cases for this. I mean, if you look at if you look at application testing to date, you know, test cases, and again, like I said before, you know, we're not writing comprehensive AIs to go from start to finish of a game. We're just trying to you know, write simple test cases that perform actions and we validate what those actions are doing. So we have, you know, a huge population of people who are technologically and developmentally capable of writing these test cases. And it's going to give them the opportunity to, you know, sort of try to break into the industry because they're now a part of the development community of gains. And this, you know, it's offering an opportunity for them that, they might not have previously had. I've talked to a, you know, a fair amount of people as we've been hiring employees, you know, they're, they're manual testers in games. They've, they have some development experience and they want to be game developers, but they haven't broken into the industry. So this is going to open up doors for people to have a chance to get a foot into that industry, I believe. And as the, I think the game automated testing industry continues to grow, it's going to offer a lot of job opportunities for people. I mean, at, at the end of the day, we want to we want to be able to provide a tool that is creating a, an underlying industry that allows people to 
you can get jobs, train up, learn expertise. And I think that's going to going to start to happen. You know, you probably have a lot of manual testers. We're always going to need manual testers. So if you have somebody who's not necessarily the, you know, is willing to sit down and learn how to write code, but, you know, writes great testing documentation and we're still going to need manual testers that are not going away. So there's still a lot of opportunity for that. And we are creating tutorials, we're creating videos, and we want to continue to empower people to, to learn how to do this. And I think, you know, there's going to be third parties who are writing blogs on how to do this stuff. And it, we just want to see the industry continue to grow and, you know, get to where enterprise application testing is, where most of your testers can sit down and write automated tests. And I think that's going to be a, a real boom for the industry. Yeah, I can see it's making sort of an on-ramp where people can incrementally develop their skills. I think that's really interesting to think about the life cycle of someone's career and just the growth. So we talked a little bit about what that first test is, checking that the start screen comes up. But let's say we have an existing application without any real automated tests. How do we come up with a list of the things that are going to be testable with automation versus what do you stay away from and say, hey, we're not going to tackle that. So maybe rather than the first day, this is like the first three months or something. I think a good starting point is is implementing MATS, which is minimal acceptance test suite of a test suite, which we have some minimal criteria that we need to ensure happens every time. You know, maybe the start screen is one, something like, can we create a new character? Once we start the game, can we save the game? And I think starting with just, you know, some simple but crucial tests that we execute every time, you know, we, we look at our, our manual testers spreadsheet or, you know, list of tests that we are executing every time, right? Which of these are going to be quick and simple and powerful? So we can implement those. Let's also reflect some of our high priority defects that have been opened in the past and ascertain whether, you know, we should create some automated testing around that because, you know, maybe that's some fragile code that we have in there that we've run into problems where things break that. As an outsider looking at a game, I can't necessarily answer that for a specific game, but a developer who's worked on that game, those things are going to pop right out to them. You know, it's going to be very obvious for them. Probably same for the for manual testers. So like, you know, every build we get, this thing is broken or a piece of it doesn't work. And, you know, these are these are quick wins. And, you know, every time a manual tester has to open a defect for something, it's burning time, it's burning cycles, burning hours that, you know, burning dollars. They could have, if we can automate it, run it, automate the you know, opening of a defect for it, you know, we, we're saving time. Anytime we can save time, it's a win. So I think that's a good opportunity in the, you know, first one to three months of let's get some wins out there. So when are these tests being run? It seems most likely you have them running during your CI, your continuous integration. Is that the answer? That's where these automated tests run or are there other possibilities? I think we're going to, we're probably going to see a mix. Uh, definitely the CI CD pipeline is, is a good, good integration point. This is no different than any other application testing. You know, you, let's say you're using Jenkins, for instance, you have Jenkins kill off, kick off your build pipeline. And then after a build is successful, all right, let's, let's run our, you know, our automated test suite and see what happens. We also have the ability for developers who are working on something to say, all right, I'm going to want to check in this code. But before I check in this code, let me review the automated tests, you know, Maybe I don't want to necessarily commit the code and wait for the automated, you know, build process to happen and 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 integrated testing to happen. Let's say I want to, you know, go ahead and just sort of test that manually on on my machine, run the test suite before I, I check any code in. So I think there's going to be opportunity between you know sitting here at your desk and executing some test cases and writing test cases, as opposed to you know adding it into the build pipeline, you know, your automated test engineer is going to literally have to sit there and test as he's, as he's writing these test cases as well. So it's going to be happening in two different places. 
It's almost as integrated test cases are being kicked off, sort of become a regression because as we're writing these, we're also testing these test cases as well. When a test fails, what does the developer want to see? So they have a name for the test, and I guess sometimes the test names can be long and, and maybe descriptive, and they get a red indicator that it's failed. What else do they need in order to then debug the issue or fix fix the problem? So there's a couple things here. We, of course, in our product, we've added the ability to capture screenshots. So, you know, if a, a test case fails, well, let's, let's grab a screenshot of what happened. You know, something more comprehensive may come down the road where you want a video of, of what happened and a log of what happened. So we have our, what we executed in our test case is essentially our log there, but also, you know, like in Unity, let's save off a copy of that log because, you know, it, it probably has some more information as well. So it's a combination of things of, you know, your typical uh, no different than if a manual tester did it, except, you know, we're adding some automated capability of, of grabbing a screenshot of well of, of what happened. And, you know, there's Unity. Again, I'm just could be un- unreal as well, but Unity, you know, one of the partners companies that we work with, Backtrace, is also, you know, collecting logs on, on failures. So I think there's a combination of tooling. We don't want to necessarily be responsible for Everything, you know, we're trying to fill a specific part in the ecosystem and integrate with other tools who are focused and are the expertise in doing that other part. So, you know, it's no different than tracking any other defect, I believe. Invent your future at CACI, a national security company revolutionizing technology through digital, C4 ISR, cyber, space, engineering, and IT transformations. You'll deliver information dominance through the development of next generation solutions. At CACI, you'll be treated like the company's greatest asset. When a company believes their people are their greatest asset, they let the best do what they do best. Visit careers.caci.com slash innovate to explore CACI's engineering and IT opportunities. One more general question, and then we'll really dive into game driver specifics. What about performance testing? I know, again, your background prior to game driver, you did a lot with performance tests. Is that a different breed of test than a functional automated test, or is it just another type of test you'd include? I guess the question is, what specific to performance testing does one have to consider when making an automated test? So in the, you know, I started doing performance testing 15 years ago and, you know, we're talking purely at the, you know, at the protocol level, right? So if you have a web application, you know, we're, we're sending that HTTP traffic over and we're measuring the response of, of the application. And with the massive multiplayer online games now, you know, you still need to test all that underlying architecture. And as testing has changed from a performance standpoint, you know, we still do a lot of the protocol level stuff, but also we're, you know, people started spinning up these different types of tests where we're not just simulating a bunch of users, but we're spawning, you know, a thousand browser instances. So we, we've got two different types of performance testing that are happening in our web-based application. And the same could be said from a client perspective. However, when you're, performance testing a game, you know, it's not just a lightweight browser page. You've got a huge resource consumption that is happening on the game, which is essentially the client itself. So it's, I think we're still going to have to retain our classic performance testing where we're doing protocol level testing to our server architecture. And we're not necessarily spawning up a thousand game instances to drive performance testing through an automation framework. That's interesting. I wasn't really thinking of the back end of the game, but that's more like a normal web application where the front end is the graphical. So I guess to be clear, now we can start talking about game driver in particular. Do you write tests for the back end as well as the graphical client or the game driver is focused exclusively on the graphical part? So, you know, the the power of reflection in, in Unity, we have the capability of doing both. So that's, you know, one of the advantages. 
you know, sorry, my classic performance test misinterpreted your question, but uh, when you're thinking, you know, frames per second, you know, how well is the client performing? So yeah, you know, all that, all that is very pertinent information. I think a lot of that is is still going to, you know, there's still going to be manual testing and, you know, identifying whether a game feels slow. So our, our agent is, yes, very lightweight. And we've, you know, looked at ways to continually to mitigate that it's not impacting, you know, frames per second. So that, you know, even if you're running an automated test, we can still, you know, pull the frames per second and make sure that the game is, you know, is functioning from a performance perspective without, you know, worrying about the impact of what we're doing. GameDriver works with Unity today. Can you speak a little bit about Unity's role in the game ecosystem, why it was chosen as your first game engine to work with, and just a little bit about Unity? Yeah, so the before me, so my other two founders, Rob and Shane, who were friends before we, we started the company, wanted to get into game development. And, you know, Unity has a very simple, I guess, knowledge cost to getting started with somebody who wants to write a game because they had some familiarity with with C sharp where you know they hadn't ever writ, written C before. So you know that that sort of took Unreal out of the equation. You know, so they were interested in, all right, let's build a game. And then, you know, well, all right, if we're going to build a game, how are we going to test a game? Because they were both of them were for, you know, the testing side of things of enterprise software. So, you know, they're already thinking ahead and they're like, well, you know, what are our options? And that sort of led to the, you know, the birth of GameDriver. And, you know, when Shane asked me, you know, if I wanted to be a part of this and as, you know, we would start with Unity first. And I think he chose Unity because he was interested in doing game development with it. And that's sort of, well, let's start here and let's build a concrete product before we try to expand. So. That's kind of how Unity was happened to be chosen as the you know the first target of our product. Can you speak a little bit to multi-platform testing? I know that Unity runs on many different platforms, including mobile. Where would you recommend a developer runs the automated tests? Do they have to test on every platform they ship on? What platforms does GameDriver support? Just give us a picture of I'm writing a game that runs on many platforms. How do I test it? You know, at the end of the day running your automated test on Windows, for instance, is only going to give you so much validation. GameDriver has the ability to be deployed on Android and iOS devices so that you can interact with those tests. We have support for some device farms as well. So if a developer doesn't have an Android device on him and he wants to run an automated test, he can you know, spin up a device on the device farm and, and run his test. You know, If you're targeting a platform, you need to make sure that it's being tested on. If you weren't, let's pretend you weren't doing automated testing. You're not going to deploy a game or an application on a device without it being manually tested. So anywhere we're manually testing, we need to see how we can introduce automated testing to help facilitate you know, that test load. And again, add all the benefits of doing automated testing to begin with. So you know we support... Windows, Mac, Linux is coming, Android, iPhone, iOS platform. We are also starting to move into the console market where Unity is supported. Switch is being targeted, Xbox is being targeted, and hopefully Sony will be targeted in the future. You talked about writing that first test, the first automated test, in sort of a generic way, but with GameDriver... Can you walk me through, in whatever detail is appropriate for this conversation, walk me through how I would add that test, and maybe there's a tutorial online for more details. Yeah, sure. So the first thing would be installing the Unity package. So we have you know your standard plugin type Unity package. You import the package into your Unity game, create a new game object, which is going to host the game driver component. Then add the script component for Game Driver that's now listed in your you know, your script dropdown. Once that's there, spin up a instance of Visual Studio or Writer, whichever you want. Now I like to you know if we're writing test cases, you know we're going to use a testing frame like InUnit, but I like to keep it even simpler. Let's create a console application in Visual Studio or Writer, or whatever. All right, first thing we do, add the required references for game driver. So I think there's maybe four references that need to be added. 
instantiate, you know, add the using statement at the top. Again, we're all, all C sharp here at the using statement, instantiate the API client, you know, with a new empty constructor, add a connect statement. All right. We're going to connect to our local host on a predefined port that is configured in the agent. We'll use our, our default port. All right. We're connected. All right. Let's wait for an object. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is add an API wait for object. So if, again, our start screen is coming up, we want to wait for the start button to be visible before you click it or hit enter or whatever. So we've created, which we actually have a patent technology, which is called Hierarchy Path. So Hierarchy Path is very similar to XPath, but allows us to reference objects in the Unity game tree by, you know, a, a stringed path, very similar to XPath. This allows testers to write tests in a way that aren't relying on coordinates and aren't necessarily relying on the exact structure of the tree not to change. So, you know, if our start button was in the root, but, you know, we refactored some things and now it's, you know, embedded down into the, a couple canvas layers or something like that, the tester can still execute the same test over and over. So we would, you know, write we also have a plugin for that as well to create some rudimentary hierarchy paths for an object that you select in the tree. So we, you know, we get the hierarchy path for our start button. We do our, you know, our client dot wait for object, pass in the hierarchy path, and then, you know, we'll do a client disconnect and, you know, boom, there's your first test case. So we've created a simple console application that connects, waits for the object and then disconnects. So you mentioned your hierarchy paths are similar to XPath. Can you remind me what XPath is? Yeah, so XPath is, you know, let's say we have an XML document, which is a, you know, node leaf tree structure. We have attributes assigned to these different nodes or the nodes have, you know, names themselves. So if we are looking for a node that has a tag called button, you know, we could simply hit, you know, forward slash, forward slash, button and it's going to go down through the tree, you know, wherever it is. And it's going to look for a relative path of an element that has the tag button. And that's the object we want to work with. So if, you know, you move that start button down, you know, 10 pixels or whatever, it doesn't matter. If you move that button anywhere else in the object tree, it doesn't matter. We're still going to find that. One of the first things people always bring up when we're, you know, we're demoing higher game driver is like, well, what if you have a massive tree? This is going to be slow. Well, slow relative maybe, but again, we're doing automated testing. It's not like we're inserting plugins that are trying to reach frames per second on test. We're executing a test case. You know, if it takes, you know, three, 400 milliseconds to identify that object, you know, okay, it is what it is, but we're able to achieve our, our impending goal of performing an action and validating the result of that. That's interesting you compare it to an XML document. So I know in Unity and other game engines, you end up with a hierarchy, which is kind of the world and the levels and the things in the world. And so you're talking about navigating that hierarchy. What does it mean to interrogate the game? I saw that reference. Is that reflection or is that making calls to an API that the game provides? What's interrogation in your in game driver terminology? Yeah, it could be both of those things. So reflection is a very powerful thing. And you know, you get it for free in Unity. And that's great for our product. So, you know, if you need to look at a specific value of a component, you know, you can get it fairly easily and we can test against that. If you want to write specific code that you want to execute that does something even more complex then you know we can still call those methods you know from the API client so you're you can have a mix of that if you want to embed a bunch of debug code and execute it not a problem if you don't want to do that and you want to still introspect variables at different times doing different things or or flag when that hits a value you know all those things are possible another term you used a little bit ago was n unit i think that's the .net version of JUnit or variation of JUnit. So I wanted to mention the previous episode here, episode 167, the history of JUnit and the future of testing with Kent Beck. I think that might be an interesting background for this. So you talked about creating a console application that runs a game driver test, then 
at what point would you recommend using a framework like NUnit? And what are the advantages of a framework with GameDriver? You know, the console is a, a very simple, let's just make it work. Let's not add the complexity of setting up an end unit with, you know, startup and tear down fixtures and, and all that complexity. Let's just keep it simple with the console application. But, you know, once you've made that work, all right, now it's time to actually migrate to a real testing framework. So, we, you know, we're, we're talking about end unit, which we create tutorials off of as well. But in reality, you can you can use any testing framework because ultimately we're you know we're instantiating the game game driver API client and we're we're executing things whatever things is so we can use any test framework to do that. But you know once you got the basics and established that you can connect and do something, all right, now it's time to start rolling this into a testing framework like NUnit, for example, and start building real test cases. So I think we've got things started. We've added tests. We've added the testing framework. Let's talk a little bit more, just some details about GameDriver or some situations I might run into if I'm a developer using GameDriver. So you mentioned screenshots on errors, but what about recording and playback in general? Is that part of some tests or all tests? What What's the role of recording and play, playback of gameplay? We're about to release, I guess, probably a a beta version of our recording tool. Now, what is a recording tool? All right, so recording, and this goes back to even application testing, the ability to record and just play back specifics is that there's so many variables. And when you introduce uh, game, you know, games in general into it, you're adding massive more variables. So the reality is that you're never going to have a simple record something and play it back with, you know, a hundred percent that it's always going to be reliable. Uh, you know, you're always going to have to work off of it. So what, what does recording add? Well, recording adds you the ability to have a, a starting structure of your test case. So, you know, you don't have to figure out all the minor details via code. You can create a scaffolding of your test case. So, you know, you can record uh, your flow of what you're testing. You're moving through the game at a specific point. We can record that. All right. Now you can take that. All right. How do we make this a repeatable test? You know, let's add some wait statements here so that we're waiting for specific actions or objects to have certain values before we move through in our test case. And coming back to where we started, you know, how are manual testers going to do this? Well, it's... As you've seen, you know, if you want to empower manual testers and test automation engineers, they're going to need to know more about the game. Just handing them a running game is not necessarily going to be sufficient for them to be able to understand how to automate the testing of that game. Now, if that happens via, you know, documentation, inf- information sharing, or they actually have the game running in Unity so that they can learn more about how to test that game, you know, that's going to vary between development studios. I read that GameDriver can run tests faster or slower than real time. In practice, do people tend to run tests at the fastest possible speed or how would you recommend people set the speed of their tests? I think keeping your your test cases at at real time has advantages of, you know, you you never know what could be introduced that could cause, you know, defects that aren't really defects. So, you know, the beauty of, of automated testing is, you know, it's, it's not just during working hours, you know, you can, you can run these things 24 seven. So the, the time criticalness of executing something faster than needs to be tested is, is probably less of a moot point. I mean, you could, if you need to run tests twice as fast, well, spin up two nodes of, you know, two Jenkins agents that are kicking off your tests simultaneously. So I think that's, you know, it's kind of a moot point, you know, whether we need to execute faster or slower. How about reusable functionality? I guess you mentioned end units, test fixtures, maybe that's the answer, but suppose I have a series of tests that all need to start with some common functionality, some common steps. Is that something that GameDriver helps you with or, or is the testing framework how you do that? Again, game driver is just a tool. It's not it's not your testing framework. So we're building a framework 
you know, maybe we have a, a set of code of how we start our game and we need to execute that in, in all of our tests if we're shutting down the game at each time. So you're going to create your own sort of testing framework of, of how you use game driver to interact with, with your particular game or product. Okay. And some couple more kind of detailed questions. One build method with Unity is called ILCPP, where the C sharp is converted to C plus plus and then compiled to a to a binary. So in that case, it's not running .NET, I guess, not in the normal way. Do you run your tests compiled down to C plus plus for a game, or would you want to run that in C sharp mode? It's funny you bring that up because that's been the bane of many headaches for myself as far as a, from a development perspective. But when we do our our own testing of of our product, we support all LTS versions of Unity. So, you know, we've got to test, you know, 2019, 2020, and now 2021, we test on Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and we test all of those against using Mono or, you know, the .NET or and we test against the IL2 CPP to make sure that it's working because, you know, if companies are building their product to run off of IL2 CPP, we want to make sure that they're able to actually automate and test with our product on those builds as well. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of configurations to test. How about the new input system versus the classic input manager in Unity? Is there anything to say there relative to GameDriver, or is that just a detail that, that games can use either one? So we, you know, for a, quite a period of time where, you know, you could go on and you could search about it on, you know, you know Google Unity new input system. And, you know, if you look back in like 20. 20 maybe, you know, there's tons of posts where people are like, oh, this thing is terrible. It's slow. It doesn't work. And that was probably like version 0.2 or something like that. I can't remember their versioning information, but now, you know, they're at version 1.3 and I think it's 1.3 and it's, you know, you've got all these people in the community who are writing blog posts. All right, here's how you use the new input system. And only recently have we started working on support for that. So it's, um, while it has some of its own challenges that we're addressing, you know, there it's a con pro for on both sides where implementing some of the game driver functionality for the old versus the new was more difficult than the other. But you know, now we're supporting it, and ultimately, you know, it we want it to be you know no fuss, no muss. Uh, are you using the old input system? Great. Are you using the new input system? No problem. Are you using a mix of them? No problem. You know, we're working to support those. We're also looking at how, now that we've added support for these, are we going to support things like Rewired? Or are we going to create some kind of SDK interface that lets people build out that compatibility no matter what input manager they're using, whether they choose to use Unities or something like Rewired or they build their own? You know, how can we still enable these people to to test their, their game and application? As I said earlier, you know, uh, critical things, user input and validation of, you know, the result of the, your, of your test. So we need to make sure that we're able to provide support for the test user input, whatever that is. Let me just flag one thing. You mentioned Rewired. Is that a company or what is that exactly? I can't tell you a whole lot about it, but it's just a product slash maybe the same, maybe company as well. Um, I can't remember, but they created their own input manager where, you know, their selling point is uh, easily switch between, you know, keyboard, mouse, Nintendo Switch controller, PlayStation, any device easily, you know, maybe they have, maybe they have better performance than the Unity input manager. I, I can't comment on the, you know, the selling points of it, but just other than the fact that we've looked into it, whether, you know, need and how to support it. Okay. We've talked about adding game driver. We've talked about some specific details. If I'm using game driver, let's start wrapping up today. I think game driver is exclusively for unity. What other game engines are you planning to support and what is the timetable for those? We've got two ongoing ports. One is Godot. We're working on, building an initial version of that. I did a proof of concept for Godot maybe maybe a year and a half ago just to, you know, 
prove it out, see how much you know product reuse we would have between the two. So we're moving moving forward with that because we want to be able to you know offer a you know we've got a what I would classify as a, a community engine, and we want to we would think it would be nice to be able to support that. And we're also working on an Unreal port as well. So we did a proof of concept with it. September last year, around there, I did a proof of concept for it. So you've got a C sharp engine and well, you know, exposed C sharp and Unity and C for Unreal. And so there's quite a bit of difference in how do we add value and again, how do we be a light footprint for developers who want to add it to their game? So there's there's still a lot of thought there, but you know we're we're actively moving forward with that. We want to continue to build out the on, on the console market as well, and we want to be synonymous with with game testing. You know whether you wrote whether you were hard to write automated tests on Unity, and then you know you moved to an Unreal project. We wanna we want to empower those people to be able to to do both. Uh, you know it's job stability for people. You know it's how do we help people? So Godot is an open source game engine in Unreal is sort of the second or first slash second big commercial game engine. Do you have a sense for how many companies you are working with have already embraced automated testing and they're just looking for a way to do it? Or is part of your sales cycle to convince companies that automated testing is worthwhile in the first place? My personal thoughts are that automated testing has been around you know, for so long you'd be hard pressed to find anybody in technology who doesn't know what automated testing is. That's not the hard sell. The hard sell is they're thinking, yes, we need to do this. How do we do this? Uh, all right, we're going to have to allocate, you know, somebody to look at this, somebody to investigate it. It's like, it's that speed bump we need to get them over, you know, you know, we're trying to build out more educational material, you know, training, quick start guides, something that allows that, you know, that speed bump, you know, not to look like a mountain, but to look like a speed bump where you're going to have to allocate a resource to, to look into this and to use it. So it's, you know, it's a project planning and how do we make it work? It's just, you know, helping people feel comfortable that one, it's not a huge time sink to even get started, which it's not. So for me, it's a, it feels like an easy sell, but you know, it's, there's a lot of things going on in the on their side of things that we don't see, but I think you know everybody is on board for automated testing. It's just you know how do we get them started? How about what developments do you see in automated testing beyond games or in games? Sort of what developments are you looking at which might impact your business and the developers in the next couple of years? Anything coming along? I think it's you know it's understanding the troubles that developers are seeing now, you know, issues that developers had to deal with in the past are are changing, you know, maybe there were, you know, they were using in-house engines and that created its own issues. And now they're moving to commercial engines like Unreal and Unity. And so now they're dealing with different issues. So how do we modify and continue to adapt our product so that we can help them solve their new challenges? with whatever that might be in the, in the future. So I think we're done. Is there anything else you'd like to add that we didn't cover today? And how can people get in touch with you and learn more about Game Driver or contact you? We're always interested to, you know, talk to anybody. As a friend of mine says, you know, I'll, I'll talk to anybody. So if you're, if you have questions or you're interested or, you know, your professor who's teaching testing and you want to learn how to, you know, <laughs> teach your, your kids about Game Driver or, you know, just testing in general, you know, we're happy to meet, we're happy to talk with anybody. You can reach us, you know, through our contact information on our website, gamedriver.io. And we wish everybody happy, happy testing going forward. And, you know, we hope you'll embrace the, the continued revolution of automated testing. Thank you. That's a good place to end. And I will put some links in the show notes for more information. This is Philip Winston for Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, 
or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.